So, here's Jonathan. Thank, thanks, Russell. Um, just as an aside, Dubchansky wrote that uh, quote that he's people use, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, for an evolution education article that he wrote when he was a professor at UC Davis. So it's, is the mic working? Or? Yeah, okay. I'm, I'm normally really loud, so I just, uh, all right. So um, what, what I want to do today um, is hopefully entertain a little, but also talk a little bit about um, why we should care about how we represent uh, evolution and evolutionary findings um, in our work and in the public domain and in communications with with other people. So um, there have been many representations of the tree of life over time. People here, I assume, are familiar with many of these. We've seen the most modern ones here, but of course there's a long history of this going back to this doodle from Darwin in one of his notebooks. Um, and we've seen lots of changes in these over time and how they represent uh, different groups of organisms and exactly how much data um, or what type of data these trees were based upon um, until we get to sort of the modern representation. And of course, there's lots of debate about, around exactly what the perfect tree is today. And this is true for every group of organisms, not just, you know, the main, you know, domains of life or however many domains there are, but of course people argue about the phylogeny within clades as we've talked about um, here. But I'm not, I'm not focusing particularly uh, today on the exact accuracy of the tree as much as exactly how we represent it. And one of the great things that we see is with um, studies such as being talked about at this meeting, they're of great interest to people out there in, in the community, other scientists, as well as the public, really are interested in the evolutionary history of organisms on the planet and the relationships among all the organisms that are on the planet. And we see lots, we've seen lots of news stories about some of the latest uh, findings in the Tree of Life. Um, all sorts of interesting uh, discussions have come out of this in the public domain, and I think it's wonderful we've done on average, the people here at this meeting and the people in the community have done a wonderful job at both communicating their work and in interacting with other people, such as the press um, and the public, and helping communicate their work. And you know, the implications of this are interesting and important. And again, I think we've done overall a really good job. But what I want to focus on is when we're not um, not doing a good job. And there are you know some simple misrepresentations. These I'll come back to. Um, just as an example, uh, archaea, the surprise is that in these relatively primitive organisms, which we know to be ancient, um, we'll come back to talk about this, ancient bacteria still alive and not evolved. Um, I don't even know what some of these mean. Um, and so this is not anything unusual as an evolutionary biologist and someone who's worked on evolution outreach. The communication about evolution um, has always been challenged. There's lots of misrepresentations of evolutionary findings, of evolutionary process, and of the implications of evolution out there uh, in the community. Some of them are silly, um, you know, alien baby found on Mars. Actually, this may be true, um, but, um, and you know, there's lots in, if you go to the weekly world news, you can find amazing stuff about evolution. Most of it, I swear, is true, but, um, really good for slides when you're teaching a class. I'm in the middle of teaching an 850 person intro bio class that started yesterday. Um, so I will be using some of these uh, in that class. Um, some are sort of funny. Uh, man evolved from rabbits, not from uh, chimpanzees. Um, so they're getting both the old model of human evolution wrong and the new model of human evolution wrong at the same time. Some are a bit perplexing, so if you go and look at what's, you know, the representation of evolution, for example, at the Creation Museum, there's some really unusual and interesting um, material there. Um, and some are dangerous. So there's a lot of uh, poor usage of misrepresentations of evolution to justify things like sexism and racism. Some of these, you know, sort of are silly, like men were involved than women in a headline, and I can't remember if that was the New York Post or somewhere like that. Some of them are uh, 
more insidious with people like Jim Watson talking about how evolution proves that women and uh, black people are less intelligent um, than other people and we need to confront this. We need to understand these misrepresentations of evolution and we need to do something about it. The misrepresentations matter. Not all of them are like the Watson racism sexism example. Um, so there's a great article, if you're interested in this, by Holly Dunsworth on how we need, when we teach about evolution, to actually confront the misuses of evolution, in particular in relation to things like racism and sexism. Um, but there are other cases where evolution is misrepresented, and it would be useful to have a better representation of evolution um, in the community. And there's some great articles about this. I've posted my slides online to SlideShare, and it, I will also write a blog post about this with links to all the articles that I've used for some of the material here. There's uh, this really good article by Kevin Padian on correcting misrepresentations of evolution in textbooks. There's some material from various websites like UC Berkeley Evolution Site and a few other places about misconceptions about evolution and why um, we should care about them. So in terms of the tree of life, uh, there are, just like with other areas of evolution, there are misrepresentations of um, evolutionary ideas and evolutionary models connected to the tree of life. And that's where I came up with this concept of the twisted tree of life. Um, I took each of these um, trees, and there's a website where you can feed them in, and it will warp your image for you and make a, a derivative image. Um, and um, I started getting really frustrated with the way certain aspects of evolution were reported in the media or were reported by other scientists. So I started giving out um, the Twisted Tree of, Tree of Life Awards on my blog. And um, I've given out about 20 of these on my blog. I now use Twitter much more than my blog. So I sort of, whenever I see something, I just post it to Twitter and complain about it. Um, but I have a collection of about 20 of these that I've given out over the last 11 or 12 years since I started my blog. Um, they're on all sorts of different topics. They're to all sorts of different groups and all sorts of different people. And what I'm going to do for the talk now is walk you through a few categories of misrepresentations of evolution that I'm calling the, the TTAL, the Twisted Tree of Life Awards. So the first category relates to inaccurate representations of the tree. That is, somehow either someone made something up about the phylogeny or they're representing something that we really consider no longer to be a good representation of the phylogeny, even if it once was a representation of the phylogeny. So whenever I search for things like this, I look for things like Five Kingdoms. I guess there's a book and a video game and a TV series. It's also called Five Kingdoms, and they even talk about evolution in this. So if you search for Five Kingdoms and evolution, you get this a lot of the time, but you can filter those out. And you can find um, still many examples in textbooks and even in uh, books and in the literature of people referring to the Five Kingdom tree as though it is the current view of evolution of different organisms. Um, and so I sort of call this, we're stuck on the five kingdoms. Um, there's one I found that was just from September uh, about plastic eating fungi may be the answer to our garbage epidemic. Fungi are one of the five kingdoms of life, six if you're American. I, I'm not 100% sure what the, um, the other four being plants, animals, monera, and protists. Um, so, you know, this isn't you know, particularly dangerous, but we do have more modern views of the tree of life than the five kingdoms. Um, I don't know if they use the, the kingdom taxonomy database to build this or not, but um, sorry, Phil. Uh, so, so, you know, there's, there's, you know, many of these out there. Here's another one from National Geographic, which is a little surprising because they actually do a pretty good job most of the time of representing uh, evolution a little more up to date than many other places. Uh, there are five kingdoms, animals, plants, fungi, chromists, um, and protozoa. So all uh, bacteria and archaea are now left out of the everything in the National Geographic tree. And they're talking, and it's important because they talk about 86% of Earth species are still unknown. They don't mention bacteria and archaea in the whole article. So I guess they're not species or something, or they don't exist. Um, so that, you know, the, the using that representation of the different groups of organisms, if they had used a more modern representation of the tree, they would know that their article is leaving out many of the organisms in the discussion. 
Uh, here's another one, just came out in August. Can you ace this fifth grade science test? What's one of the five major kingdoms of life, mammals or fungi? Um, and the answer is the fungi, of course. So um, hopefully some fifth graders would say, no, that's not right. There's no five kingdoms anymore, um, or something of that effect. And again, you know, it doesn't seem like that big a deal some of the time, but because of things like that National Geographic article, where if you use that framework of the five kingdoms, you're going to present a really skewed view of important topics like conservation biology and biodiversity, it is important to get the phylogeny itself accurate. So another topic, this will probably be controversial at this meeting a little bit, is the issue of prokaryotes uh, versus eukaryotes. And there's been a lot of discussion of this over the years since the, you know, Woese and other people revising the phylogeny of prokaryotes into uh, two apparent major lineages has come up that um, relying upon the prokaryote eukaryotic dichotomy in discussions, in naming, in scientific papers and textbooks creates all sorts of problems for discussion of biology, both among scientists and among the public. And so the, the main point, of course, is that if you have a phylogeny, in particular a rooted phylogeny, um, and whichever phylogeny you believe, so if you believe the eukaryotes are you know, a separate monophyletic group from the archaea, if you believe that they came from within the archaea, prokaryotes in this tree are not a monophyletic group. And in general, in biological naming, we try to use names that correspond to monophyletic groups. There's a massive amount of literature and argument about doing this in other groups of organisms. Sometimes that uh, doesn't take hold and sometimes it does. Uh, the same is true for, again, whichever version of the tree of life you use. So people may be familiar with the birds uh, reptiles debate. So birds phylogenetically evolved from the middle of the group that people generally refer to as reptiles. Birds, in fact, are on a branch that uh, is within the dinosaur branch of the tree of life within reptiles. So um, birds are, if you want to keep the name reptiles, then birds are reptiles. If you want to keep the name birds, then you need to rename many of the other groups of reptiles so that they correspond to monophyletic groups rather than um, polyphyletic groups. Um, so people do this again in the plant world. Um, Every one of the sort of major groups of plants, people have argued about whether or not they're monophyletic. And once people come to a resolution as to what the phylogeny is, the namings of these groups frequently get rewritten so that the names correspond to monophyletic groupings. So here it is with plants, here it is with animals. And there's you know, issues with some people say, well, maybe sponges, there may be a group of organisms that we call sponges that actually branched off here. And that would make sponges a non-monophyletic group. And therefore, using the term sponge to refer to groups of organisms is inappropriate because you're now lumping together organisms that span across a particular node in the tree and are not all the descendants of that node. So monophyletic is basically a grouping of organisms where you include all the taxa that descended from a particular node in the tree of life and nothing else. So if you include anything outside of that group, or if things within your group are excluded, that's not a monophyletic grouping. So prokaryotes in the, the rooted trees of life that people are using, whether or not, again, we believe eukaryotes are separate from the archaea or eukaryotes are within what used to be known as archaea and now should be renamed, if you think that that's what the phylogeny looks like, then um, either way, prokaryotes are not a monophyletic grouping. Um, that hasn't stopped people from using prokaryotes in the literature and in textbooks and in the community, um, but it probably should. It probably should stop using the term prokaryote, and we should start using um, bacteria and archaea, or if archaea are not monophyletic, we should consider renaming them. And this is not, you know, there's lots and lots of groups out there that are still using the term prokaryote. Um, it's one of the most pervasive non-monophyletic groupings used um, throughout the scientific literature. Um, there's even, I find this a bit ironic, um, I don't, I, that there's a committee on systematics of prokaryotes talking about taxonomy and then using a non-monophyletic grouping uh, within the context of that taxonomy. So a few years ago, Norm Pace was giving a talk at uh, Davis, and I saw a tweet from Noah Fear where he said, we need to write a Norm Pace macro for Word 
where it replaces prokaryote with bacteria and archaea and inserts miscellaneous expletives into the text. And since Norm was coming to give a talk the day after I saw this, um, I made one. Um, so it turns out you can edit uh, Google Drive and Google Doc uh, settings so that it will autocorrect anything you want to some other thing. And I made a little video of what happens when I type into a new Google Doc, um, prokaryotes. It automatically replaces it with bacteria and archaea. This was, yeah, sorry, I will fix that later. Um, so um, this was very frustrating because I actually, I told some people that I prepared this talk in a different way than I normally do. I actually made my entire talk as an outline in Google Docs rather than working with slides because I wanted to get sort of the flow correct. And every time I would type prokaryotes not paying attention, I would come back to it and I'd be like, what? What? Wait, what? I, I didn't remember about my autocorrect um, feature within Google Docs. So I had to start typing abbreviations like prokes um, when I wanted to remind myself to talk about prokaryotes. So Norm in his talk showed his, you know, uh, just say no to prokaryotes message. He, people made buttons with these. Norm has an article, if you're interested in it, um, that talks about it's time to retire the prokaryote. Um, I generally think that this is a worthwhile thing to do now, given the current models of the tree of life. Um, so that's sort of about the representation of the structure of the tree. There are lots and lots of other things that are really important to consider that are more about rep terminology or process in phylogeny, and that's what I'm going to talk about for the next few minutes. So in terms of terminology, there are lots of terms that themselves are routinely misused in phylogenetic studies, in phylogenetic discussions, in news stories, and in interaction with the public about evolution, the tree of life, and related topics. One of them, I'm just going to give you a few examples of them. One of them is the term primitive. So the, you know, the real definition of pr primitive is relating to denoting or preserving the character of an early stage in the evolutionary or historical development of something, some organism, or it could be chairs or some other feature in the history. So if we're talking about modern organisms, the organisms cannot be primitive. They could have a feature that you might want to say was a trait, that that trait showed up a long time ago, and now if you're referring just to the trait, you might want to call it an ancestral trait, but you, you know, you might be able to get away with calling it a primitive trait. I think it carries too many connotations to be a wise thing to use, but organisms that exist today are not primitive. Some of their features might be ancestral. Um, some of their features will be derived. Uh, if you have a sample of an organism like a fossil from the past, you could technically use this term in a more appropriate way, but, but not for modern organisms. So this is routine in news stories about archaea and sometimes about bacteria and sometimes about um, single-celled eukaryotes that um, the term primitive is used over and over and over in a variety of ways. Most of them are not being used in an appropriate way. Some of them are sort of referring to things that happened a long time ago in the past and might be appropriate uses. There's a related sort of similar topic, which is the use of the term higher organism and lower organism. Um, generally, what people mean by this is we have a representation of the tree of life that proceeds up to organisms that we think are complex, like us, and at the, we draw them at the top of the tree. It's like a ladder, a ladder of climbing progression through evolution, and when we get to the top of the tree, those are the higher organisms. And the ones down at the bottom are primitive and lower organisms. It is meaningless from an evolutionary point of view and generally should not be used in discussion of any biology. Um, but yet it is incredibly common. So here's an article about um, some interesting CRISPR work from Emmanuel Charpentier um, where they talk about you know, finding the genes especially in higher eukaryotic organisms but also in microbes. So I guess um, and I'm not even sure which the, where the eukaryotic organisms that are not higher organisms but are microbes fit into this um, story. Uh, you'd see the same effect in bacteria, a lower organism, 
Um, when the bacteria DNA is compacted by this particular enzyme, DPS. Um, in EMBO, just came out uh, or last year, there's an article that uses this over and over and over to refer to higher organisms, higher organisms, lower organisms, and information content. It's just completely inappropriate usage in a scientific article, and it implies all sorts of things that are inaccurate. Um, you see this a lot in the psychiatry literature, unfortunately. Here's an example. Um, conservation of schizophrenia risk genes in lower organisms reflects their essential function. Um, here's another one. Um, the roots of most higher plant species form arbuscular mycorrhizae. After all, this is another part of this article. After all, that is the predominant form of signaling in higher organisms. This is from a National Academy report on the new biology for the 21st century, um, future of all of life sciences. I'm showing this to you because I was a co-author. Um, <laughs> So I'm not immune to this. It slips out occasionally. Sometimes um, we use this terminology, both ancient and primitive and higher and lower, a lot. We should try and uh, avoid it at all costs. So when I found this, I started to search in my folder of my scientific papers. Oh, it's really sad. Um, here's a review article that Claire Frazier, me, and Steve Salzberg wrote in early in the days of genome sequencing. Uh, the DOX pathway functions in some bacteria, algae, and higher plants. Still not sure where I, how I draw higher plants. Here's my first genome paper, Chlorobium tepidum. I coordinated the analysis of this genome when I came to Tiger. Karen Ketchum had been sequencing it, and I took over the analysis. CO2 assimilation in higher plants, algae, and so on. So it's not, everybody does this, or not everybody. Um, uh, lots of people do this. We should stop doing it. Ancient is a similar issue, um, although ancient actually has a, a definition that is appropriate in many biological studies. It's just frequently used in inappropriate ways. The definition is it belonging to the very distant past and no longer in existence. That's the definition I picked up off of, I think, the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, but it's usually used to refer to uh, bacteria or archaea that people think of as lower organisms, that is in the tree they draw, they're branching at the bottom of the tree, even though you can rotate branches around nodes and put them up at the top of the tree and then they're no longer lower organisms. But anyway, um, uh, ancient organisms um, is particularly a term referred to, uh, you know, such taxa that are at the end of some long branch or when we draw the tree in one way or at the bottom of the tree. Here's ancient bacteria found in hunter-gatherer guts. Ancient bacteria shed light on turning water into energy. It's also an inappropriate use and can frequently lead to misconceptions and bad conclusions about biology. Another one which I am unquestionably guilty of using all the time is the term basal. Um, basal has a true definition in phylogeny. It is usually used incorrectly. Um, basal generally refers to nodes, that is the connection points of branches in the tree, nodes near the root of a rooted tree. It should not be used to refer to clades or taxa, because if you have a tree where you have like 20 taxa on a branch that you drew on the top of your tree and one taxon coming off the branch at the bottom and you call that one basal, if you flip your node, that organism is now at the top of your tree and it no longer instinctively should be called basal and it's usually used inappropriately. There's a really good blog post by Stacy Smith about the issues with using basal and related terminology that if you're interested in this, I suggest you look at. And again, I've posted all my slides and I'll post links to all these. And she goes into a discussion of related terms like early diverging, first branching, basal, etc., that all relate to the same issue of sort of not thinking about branch rotation in trees and referring to basal for organisms rather than nodes in the tree itself. So she says, you know, the tree has a base where there's a most basal branching and the next most basal branching, but there is no such thing as a basal clade. That is, it refers to branch points, not organisms. There are many other terms that have been sort of inappropriately used, like these deeply branching, early diverging related to basal. Simple versus complex is fraught with problems. Missing link is frequently also fraught with problems. I'm not even going to go into similarity versus homology. Similarity is a measurement. Homology is an inference. Things are not 50% homologous. 
Um, they are, you can measure the similarity and then you conclude whether or not you think things share a common ancestry that makes them homologous. So um, just as there are sort of terminology problems, there's also sort of general misrepresentations of evolutionary process that have occurred. I'm going to talk about a couple of these. So um, one is adaptationism, which people may be familiar with this from the point of view. It was um, written about a lot by Stephen Jay Gould and Dick Lewinton. And this relates to the belief or assumption now generally held that each feature of an organism is the result of evolutionary adaptation for a particular function. And we can look at those organisms, I mean, this is a correlate to this, which is we can look at the organism, guess what that function is, and conclude that it was created by response to natural selection for that particular function. And it's sort of generally referred to as adaptationism. There's a great um, article that they wrote about this on the spandrels of San Marco, San Marco, and if you're interested in this, you can read it. A few years ago, probably 15 years ago now, I started getting frustrated with seeing adaptationism uh, writ large throughout all the genomics field. Um, we would sequence a genome and then make an observation and conclude that it was adaptive and that we knew what the adaptation was due to. So I coined a term, adaptationomics, um, just rewrote the adaptationism and said, you know, the belief or assumption now generally held that each genomic feature of an organism is the result of an evolutionary adaptation. And I, I railed on and on about this. I gave out adaptationomics awards. Um, I'd be happy to talk to people about this. Um, I gave them, some of them to myself, papers I was on and to colleagues. Um, Carl Zimmer had a related term um, that he referred to YAGS, yet another genome sequence where scientists have sequenced the genome of species X, their research published today in the Journal of Terribly Important Studies will lead to new insights about this important species. Maybe it will even cure cancer and eliminate world hunger. And he talked a little bit about this in, in the context of you make an observation in the genome and you just, you can immediately figure out why it's adaptive for that organism, ignoring the thousands of scientific papers that show that organisms are not optimized. And therefore, if you have a feature, it doesn't mean that it's adaptive in the organism. So um, anyway, so another related sort of process issue is the anthropomorphizing of organisms. And the general definition of this is attributing human characteristics or behavior to something, a god, an animal, an object, another organism on the planet. And you might think that this would be rare among microbes because they're not very human-like in many ways, but it's actually remarkably common. Um, there's an article by Julian Davies, a sort of classical microbiologist, discussing this, in particular in the context of microbes, where he says microbiology seems particularly susceptible, and the literature is littered with examples of bacteria having to make a choice to use a particular substrate, or decision to make a compound, or needing something in some way. And this anthropomorphizing organisms like bacteria and archaea and other organisms is also fraught with problems and can lead to lots of misrepresentations of biology and evolution. There's a really good talk. It's an hour long if you are interested in it. Um, but uh, Heidi Elmendorf from Georgetown has a talk on the moral relativism of microbes to be or not to be virulent. And it's basically about the issue of um, microbes are not good or bad, right? I mean, they're not choosing to be the dangerous microbe or the good microbe. And there's so much literature out there where people are talking about like, the microbes in our gut are there to help us. The good microbes in our gut are there to help us. And then there are bad microbes in the gut um, that are there to kill us. And it's, there's so much anthropomorphizing of this that it can be really, really problematic. Um, there's lots of other examples of this. Marina Malley has a book on philosophy of microbiology that talks about a lot of these issues. It's really really quite good. Um, there's all sorts of issues with processes. Again, evolution is not really trying to do anything. It's a process that occurs and then there are results in the end of it, but it's not trying for anything. There are no good or bad microbes. Um, uh, another one about process that really gets me crazy is when you observe differences between organisms and you say one of the organisms has a mutation, when you don't know what the direction of change was between those organisms. Um, <laughs> Anyway, and so then the, the last uh, category I want to talk about is um, the, the 
category, which is pretty common in other parts of the evolutionary world, and occasionally you see it in uh, studies of microbes, which is basically Darwin and evolution are the same thing. And if Darwin got something wrong in the 1850s, therefore all evolution is wrong, or um, the model of evolution that we have is thrown on its head when people are basically ignoring 150 years of literature that were saying somewhat of the same thing, but then they refer back to Darwin as though that is the ultimate arbitrator of all things about evolution. And so you see this, there are articles about this every week or so, Darwin was wrong. Was Darwin wrong? What Darwin got wrong? Darwin was wrong. Was Darwin, I mean, they're, they're just all the time. And it's like, oh my God, if we did this for, I mean, Darwin didn't know about DNA, genes, molecular biology, microbes a little bit, but he kind of ignored them. I mean, like, you know, it's crazy, right? Um, so there are some things occasionally that you will see about microbes where people say, oh, look at this thing that happened with microbes. Darwin was wrong. Therefore, all of evolution is crap or something related to that. Um, uh, this is from like a creation website, so we can sort of, you know, ignore some of it. Um, horizontal gene transfer, so it, it occurs and therefore Darwin was wrong and therefore evolution is bogus. Um, uh, swimming bacteria, because bacteria aren't supposed to swim according to Darwin, um, therefore it defies Darwin's theory. And I have yet to find literature on Darwin talking about immobile bacteria. <laughs> Um, anyway, so there's, there's lots of things out there. That I just wanted to give you a little bit of uh, examples to think about. I think we should, we all should probably think about some of these issues when we talk about evolution and the tree of life, when we interact with students, when we write our papers, when we interact with the public. Hopefully, um, these twisted trees of life will get less and less frequent and we will get back to debating the tree of life itself, which of course is still a big area of scientific study and a big area of debate. And again, I will post all my notes on this and the links if you're interested in more of it. And thanks. And I, I get. Well, so so or. So reptiles is probably an inappropriate term if we want to keep the term birds. So we have to make a choice as taxonomists to either erase reptiles um, and therefore keep birds or erase birds and consider birds a subgroup within the larger reptile group. And then the same is true with archaea. So that um, if we want to keep the term archaea, given the latest rooted trees that I've seen, Eukaryotes do not exist as a separate third domain of life. They are a subgroup within the archaea. And no, no, I said if, so, so archaea would be monophyletic in that case if we made eukaryotes archaea, right? So you have to, it, it's an iterative process with going through, that's the same thing with birds. Reptiles could be monophyletic, but not if birds are considered a separate grouping from reptiles. Yeah. No, I mean, I think this is the fundamental question. It's really important. I think it's a challenge in some cases to do that and not in others. So like Norm Pace kept saying, look, it's not that hard to replace prokaryotes with bacteria and archaea. It doesn't really make your life any more difficult about communicating something. And so that was a case where it was a trivial change that people had to do in order to discuss it in a phylogenetically correct context. Whereas, as the example you're talking about, the bad versus good, I mean, I, I know a lot about this because I co-ran two conferences on exactly this topic, 
And people debated exactly what you're talking about with the bad versus good microbes. And the conclusion at the end was that we need to do a much better job of the, the fuzzy areas, that too much of it was bad versus good, and not enough of it ever contained the gray areas, but that people said, we still, you know, we don't want to burden every conversation with, uh, you know, an exception. So I, I have the same problem when I'm teaching this big introductory biology class. We want to refer to, you know, features of groups of organisms. Well, plants are photosynthetic, oh, except for the parasitic plants. Um, and so, like, you, you can't just always have a conversation where you're always stating the exceptions to some grouping. So I think you're, you're absolutely right. I don't know in every case where, where the boundary sits. And, and I think you just have to sort of assess it. It's really important to be aware of the risks of doing it wrong. Yeah. Yeah, so in um, giving out this Adaptation Omics Award and giving out my Overselling the Microbiome Award and giving out my Twisted Tree of Life Award, um, I, I sometimes focus on the press, but actually in the end, most cases that I dig into, it's the press release associated with a study that contains the inaccuracies. And the press is in fact going with something that was done probably not by the scientists, but by a communication group associated with an institute or with some journal or some other entity. And I think that those, that's the, one of the stages where care is really, really needed um, because a lot of uh, press take those press releases as facts. And so just as an aside, I'm on the, the AAAS council now and at the AAAS meeting this year, this issue was raised where AAAS publishes Eureka Alerts, which are press releases. They are non-reviewed, and many of them contain massive mistakes and errors. And so there's a discussion at AAAS about whether or not to change the labeling, at least, to say that these are completely unreviewed in some way, rather than presenting them. They're called news. They're not even called press releases when they are, in fact, just press releases. So I think... Um, for, for that, inter that part of the interface with writing about scientific work, the press release is really, really, really important. I think that in general and other types of discussions, in, in my experience, I've basically, like 90% of the time, the reporters that I've interacted with are trying to represent the story accurately. The 10% who are trying not to represent the story accurately, that's nothing you can do. I mean, it doesn't matter how you communicate with them. Whereas the other 90%, I think that if you just, like when, when a press release is coming out or when you're talking to them, think about the way you're saying things a little more carefully is very, very helpful. And now I, I do much more screening of press releases than I ever used to for that reason. And it seems to uh, impact it quite a bit. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. I agree very Yeah, I don't know if you heard that, but he said if you publish your uh, paper, write your own press release and work with the press office. And I've started doing the same thing, and, and it really makes a big difference. It takes a little bit of extra work, but saves you an enormous amount of trouble uh, in the long run. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I, would, uh, I would not say that you cannot say early branching. I mean, whatever you, however you flip the note, uh, it remains early branching, even if Slapped it down. It depends. You have the proof, and then you have the earliest branching. This is what I use in, in my paper. And that's the earliest of the group. If the branching is got, even if you flip the node, you remain. Yeah. So, but but the organism did not branch early. The branch it's happened the early. Branch. It's the node, right? So the key is that. Uh, so an early branching organism. Yeah. It's a lineage. You can use lineage some people have started to use in this context because it sort of hints at the branch as opposed to the end of the branch. Yeah, right. And you should read that article is really good by Stacy Smith about how to phrase these things in better ways. I'm, I'm not an expert in it. Yeah, Don. So um, speaking of sort of the lineage, just bringing it all 
called showing an image, but we know that there's a lot of, a lot of lateral gene transfer. So that gets at sort of how do you actually represent uh, the complexity of gene lineages versus organismal lineages? Yeah, so th this is a great, I mean, I don't know if people heard, but it's the question is basically with lateral gene transfer and also endosymbiosis, how do we represent the complexities of, you know, phylogeny and discuss them? It's, it's very hard. I mean, like, with lateral gene transfer, it's more of an issue of, like, how much has occurred. And so then do you say, like, what does monophyly mean in the context of endosymbiosis, for example, and in the context of lateral gene transfer? You have to be really careful with what you're talking about because... Um, the resulting organisms could be monophyletic after an event of lateral gene transfer or endosymbiosis, but the symbiont itself, like the mitochondrial ancestor and the chloroplast ancestor, ancestor and or the nucleus, they have a really, it's complex how to word that and how to phrase it. And I, in many cases, I'm at a loss for how to, how to discuss some of those. So I, I don't have a great solution. Yeah. Yeah, so, so it's say, saying that a network is probably better than a phylogeny. That's absolutely true um, in, for, for all taxa. That has been true, by the way, uh, prior to the emergence of the knowledge about the extent of horizontal gene transfer because there's been hybridization events between you know, different members of different families even within plants. And there's lots of reticulation in trees that occurs by means of hybridization, not just lateral gene transfer. So this is a big issue throughout the tree and has been for a long time and mostly is just glossed over. Okay. Thank you. Structural motif in the ruined grass. Yeah. Um, that are quite tricky to detect in any other way, but quite straightforward. 